I know what you're thinking. How can Joe Ovias and Joe Giglio milk this Roy Williams podcast? Folks, we're going to milk it as much as we can. And how can we not, Giglio? The man is still out and about living his best life right down to a Super Bowl commercial this year. Yes, I was ecstatic that Roy was able to help WRAL and help us by doing a, a surprise turn as Ramsey's mm-hmm. in the Super Bowl commercial. Spoilers. Sorry. <laughs> didn't mean to give it away. Um, but no, I, you know, Joe, it's funny. Uh, ever since we've done the podcast and we've done the show, and I, I try to tell people that the podcast is the best work that I've done in 25 years in this business. And, and it's not because of the work that I did. It's because of the stories that Roy Williams tells. So mm-hmm. please, by all means, listen to all of the stories and I think we packaged it in a way that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but people always say to me, like, well, how did you ever convince Roy Williams to give you the time, you know, to do the podcast? Why Why does he like you? And it's funny because this reminded me why uh, our big boss had asked us, had asked me to get Roy for the Super Bowl commercial. Mm-hmm. And so I had to say to him, I go, you know, the real reason that Roy likes me. And Joel had said, no. I don't. <laughs> so in 2019, I wrote people a st- like you Wait, exactly. Yeah. And, and people from Carolina, like da- true Tar Heels, like Roy, what? like a, a real Tar Heel. Uh, yes, it's true. In 2019, I wrote a story about uh, he was doing a coaches versus cancer clinic down in Pinehurst with Hunter Morin, who is one of his really good friends. And you'll love this, Joe. Roy is great friends with Hunter in part because Hunter never talks to him about basketball. He's an investment banker, loves the Tar Heels. Please don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but he loves this guy because he's never getting the, why don't you call more timeouts? Why don't you recruit this guy? Why don't you do that? What it's was like, up with the minutes? It's yeah. like he just, he's a true friend to him and talks to him about anything other than basketball. So uh, unfortunately, Hunter had a, had a five-year-old grandson who had a rare brain cancer. And Roy had said to me, hey, can you help me? Uh, help me out. I want to write, I want, you know, get the word out that I'm trying to raise a million dollars for, you know, the cancer fund for coaches versus cancer. I said, absolutely. I will, I will obviously help anyone in the cancer community, given my own wife's, you know, fight Mm -hmm. against breast cancer. So I write the story. This was in the spring because it was before they went to Piners, had this golf event, which Roy played in, which he had forgot his golf shoes, the whole thing. He's, he's a nut. So he sees me at the ACC basketball kickoff. And he says to me, I want to thank you. And I was like, what did I do? Because yeah. I'd, I'd kind of forgotten about it. Not mm-hmm. because it wasn't memorable. Just, you know, we're moving along, right? And he goes, I want to thank you. I go, uh, what did I do now? And he goes, <laughs> we had some, because his goal was a million dollars. He goes, we did raise the million dollars. He goes, we had an anonymous donor who straight up told me, I read the article, and he gave us a $1.5 million. That's amazing. As an anonymous gift. That's amazing. So this gets us to modern day. This winter, uh, Joel Davis asked me, hey, can you help me get Roy Williams? And I said, the reason Roy, I, I retell the story of why Roy mm-hmm. likes me. I go, I bet you, if you say, you know, Capital Broadcasting would be willing to make a donation to Coaches versus Cancer or, or, or St. Baldrick's or one of the cancer funds that Roy supports, Lineberger Foundation over at Carolina. I said, I bet you he would do it. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, uh, you know, I get a um, I get a text from Roy's secretary, Kay, and she says, uh, Roy says you should be his agent now because you got him, you know, lined up to do all these things. I said, well, no, I don't need to do that job. I said, but I do appreciate him helping us out. So, and of course... Gerald Owens yes. ends up over at WRL ends up having a conversation with him, which you guys are about to hear. And, and of course, Roy doesn't disappoint with the stories. No, it sounded really silly and sort of crazy. And I said, that's right down my alley. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm retired now. I don't care. You know, I'm 72 years old. When you get to be 72, you don't really care what you say or what uh-huh. people think. And when you get to 72 and you're completely retired, you really don't care. <laughs> so I thought it'd be something my grandchildren could laugh at me. And that was mm. really the bottom line. I saw that when they see this, if it works and if it ever comes out, I said the grandchildren, they all, they all laughed themselves silly. Would you have done this five years ago? Uh, it would have been harder then, you know, because it's just three years, five years ago, I was afraid to give away two hours because I thought somebody else was going to be working during that time. Mm-hmm. But I still tried to do a lot of things, but not like I am now. But uh, 
Uh, as I say, when you get older, you don't care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really grass is green to where I'm standing, regardless of whatever the people think. <laughs> The first year of retirement, did Wanda have to say, okay, pump the brakes, big guy. You're not coaching anymore. Uh, No. Uh, You know, I sort of keep it even more to myself. Now, I tried not to bring it home even when I was working. I'd say, well, what would you think? And she'd give me her three or four minutes, and that's about all we would talk about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, I would most of the time I'd go to bed, and when she went to sleep, I'd get up and stay up all night after a bad loss or any loss, basically. But Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so for me, uh, that is the good part. You know, I, I, it's it's not my life. It's not the first thing I think of in the morning. It's not the last thing I think of at night. It's not involved in any decision I make. Whereas for 48 years, coaching was involved in every decision I made. And uh, so that part's good. And it's uh, one of the best things that's really silly is that I sit right beside the tunnel. Mm-hmm. So when the players go out after the game, I go right behind them, go up the steps in the parking lot, get my car, and I'm almost home before Hubert gets to his press conference. <laughs> and I love that part. <laughs> That's uh-huh, it. Without having to talk to anybody. Yeah, and, and it's <laughs> neat because the fans over the last year and a half, last year and then so far this season, they understand that before the game, I'll take pictures, sign autographs. But when I come out that back door, I'm getting in the car and I'm heading to the house. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so that part, uh, I, that's the most enjoyable thing is how quickly I can get out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> Last year was magical. Yeah. Uh, they finished really well. This year has been a struggle by UNC standards. Is mm-hmm. it difficult for you to watch that? Well, it was, it was probably a little more difficult last year. And because um, Hubert was not a known quantity to people except me. And people don't realize that the last player I helped recruit as Coach Smith's assistant was Hubert Davis. And I feel like that when you cut Roy Williams, I'm going to bleed Carolina blue more than anybody. And Hubert's right there with me. Uh-huh. He's the nicest person I've ever known in my life who is also fiercely competitive. And so last year, you know, last year in the middle of the season, we're about where we were right now. And I told a bunch of my buddies, you wait and see at the end of the year, we're going to be right there. We'll make a run. Mm-hmm. And I believed it in my heart and my soul. And I believe it even stronger this year. Uh-huh. Uh, but, you know, it's college basketball. It's a long season. There are other good teams. And regardless of what North Carolina fans think, it's not our divine right to win every game. You know, (laughs) I felt that a little bit more as a coach than I do now because I'm still a fan. But uh, we're going to be fine. And we've got the parts. Hubert's tough enough to they'll they'll change and start going in the direction he wants them to go a little bit more and a little bit more. And I just think he's the perfect coach, uh, the perfect human being to uh, to be the coach at North Carolina. So when the game is going on. I'm interested in the game, mm-hmm. but as soon as the game's over, with, I just want him to be feeling good. That's all I care about. Do you guys talk often? Does he reach out to for advice? Not much, and I try to make sure that I don't reach out because I want it to be if he wants something, I want him to, you know, I I sneak in the door in the office. They gave me a little, what used to be a little storage room. They've given me a nice little office over there, and I'll sneak in there at times and sneak out. But uh, it's his team, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, uh, as I said, I miss it tremendously if I, if I could snap my fingers and go back to 52, uh, I would have done it for another 20 years. <laughs> I, I sort of wanted to win a big game and go in the locker room and act silly and uh, get right to the door of the press conference. And before I went in, just to drop over dead. Now, I win a big game and not wow. have to talk to the media. So, <laughs> <That's> pretty final. <laughs> yeah, that's the way I wanted it to be. I really didn't have in my mind that I ever wanted to retire. And so, but it's been good. It really has. But uh, right now, we've got the right man. And, uh, uh, he's he's absolutely the best. So fans should say, give him time. Oh, just yeah. well, the one fan that I know personally, I said, shut up, because <laughs> you don't know enough to even make those kind of statements, uh-huh. you know. But to the fans, just understand, we're going to be okay. And uh, Hubert Davis is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Have you learned anything about yourself that you had forgotten as mm-hmm. being involved, so involved in basketball for forty-eight years? As a coach? I think uh, if there is anything, it's feel how lucky I am because I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And uh, Luke Bryan's a country singer and he has a song that uh, I'll paraphrase a little bit, said, said, find something you love to do and call it work. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did for 48 years. Mm-hmm. And so I guess the big thing is hit me is how lucky I was to do that. And it's like I say, I miss it tremendously, but it was the right decision. Uh, but that's, uh, I didn't know what to feel. So it, I didn't have any game plan or anything. I just uh, knew it was the right time. But uh, um, I was I was fortunate. I never went to work a single day in my life. I really <laughs> didn't. I didn't. I never felt like I was going to work. I was uh, 
doing what I wanted to do, and I think I'm highly blessed. Coaches don't like answering hypothetical questions. You're not coaching anymore, yeah. so I'm going to try one. Okay. Okay, you're in a boat. You have two oars. You're taking on water in choppy seas. NIL and transfer portal are on board. you got to get rid of one of them or the boat sinks. Uh, I jump in the water and swim. <laughs> uh, NIL, I'm sort of on the fence because, you know, we did need to make it better for kids. I still go back. Peyton Manning's a friend in his last year at Tennessee. They sold some. I'll miss the numbers now. It's a long time mm -hmm. ago. Uh, they sold something like 50,000 jerseys with Manning name on the back at $56 a clip, and he didn't get a cent. That's not right. Okay, come on. You know, we can make it better, and I think – with the cost of attendance and changes we've made in the last 10 years, it has gotten better. But we're going over a little more now, you know, uh, it's every kid in junior and high school has got an agent. And, you know, you have to talk about how much money you can make. And that, I'm old school, and that's not what I think college athletics should be. But mm -hmm. I still think we can make it better. And, and we have made it better, but I think we could make it even, even more. But it's gotten a little Wild West attitude of anything's go out there now. So the transfer portal, I don't mind a kid transferring. I do believe that you make a commitment, you ought to be tough enough to handle a little adversity, though, instead of coach yelling at you on Saturday at game day in the middle of a football game and you transfer on Monday. Uh -huh. I think that's sort of stupid. So I don't mind a kid transferring, but I do think they should have to sit out of here. You know, and they say, well, coaches don't have to get sit, you know, sit out. Well, coaches get fired. Right. I mean, I've never fired a player. I thought about it, you know, sometimes. And, and, uh, but so there, there are things that uh, I wouldn't enjoy as much, but it had nothing to do with me making a decision. But I think the purity of, the, of college athletics is something that I loved. And for me, my whole life was trying to take a group like you guys, uh, everybody to make sacrifices for a common goal for the team. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I really loved. And so that was uh, those two issues, both of them in the boat, which one would I throw out? I'd leave both of them in. I'd go ahead and swim. <laughs> I'm not a good swimmer. I'd go, go my own way. <laughs> uh, in your opinion, have they been to the detriment of college basketball? Not yet uh, in my eyes. But, again, I'm not involved now. I'm not sitting in that living room and somebody says, well, so-and-so is offering us this kind of thing. and Because that would really bother me a great deal. But, uh, you know, when North Carolina and Duke play, when North Carolina and North Carolina State play, it's still the Tar Heels against the Wolfpack, and it's still the Tar Heels against the Blue Devils, and it's who's going to play the best that night. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting cold chills even talking about that because that's, to me, what college athletics is about. We're far enough removed now from his retirement on April 1st, 2021, that we we cannot imagine how Roy Williams would have operated with the way college basketball's being played now. I mean, you just heard him with Gerald Owens about he doesn't like how things have kind of played out. And to a certain extent, Joe, and, and one of the things that we've talked about on the show is North Carolina in general, not just how Roy Williams would have handled it, but the school and how they've always gone about it with their basketball program has had to adapt. And they're slowly being brought on to where college basketball is today. Yeah, it's interesting because if you talk to coaches in the ACC, and of course they're always going to point to the SEC. Of course, right? of course. But <laughs> they look at it and they go, look at what Arkansas is doing. Just, you know, NIL, or Texas A&M football, NIL. And it's just a foreign concept that before you had Duke and Carolina, and I'm not saying they never colored outside the lines. I'm just saying... For the most part, that brand, those brands of Duke and Carolina were enough mm -hmm. to play for those Hall of Fame coaches that were at those schools was enough. And for a lot of players, I'm not saying for all of them, but for a lot of players, it was. And now what NIL has done, as we saw with Miami winning the league this year, spending the money that they did to get the players that they did. Now, you still have to get good players, Joe. Yeah, you got to identify you, them. You can't just willy nilly throw, yep. you know, a uh, million dollars around and think you're suddenly be going going to win. But I do think there's a couple things at work here. You, you have the, the higher end recruits who almost all would go to Kentucky, Carolina, Duke. Some of them now are going to the, to the G League. Mm -hmm. They're going to play elsewhere. They're not playing college basketball, period. That doesn't affect NC State. That doesn't affect Clemson. That affects Duke and Carolina. And then you have other player, other schools like Miami, like, yeah, one of their best players is from Arkansas State. Mm -hmm. I, I 
there's still an ego in play with Carolina and Duke where are they really willing to go and get some of these players like a Normat, Norchad O'Meara, who you might think, well, he was not good enough to play for Duke or Carolina, right? Even think about where Carolina's re- our transfers were coming from. Northwestern with Nance and his family. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you had Brady Manick at Oklahoma. That you know, I'm not saying you can't go and get players from other Power Five programs, but I think at some point Duke and Carolina are going to have to reevaluate. Well, where do good college basketball players come from? Mm-hmm. And I, one of the things you and I have talked a lot about on the OG, which of course you can listen to from three to six thirty every day on ninety nine nine The Fan. One of the things that we've talked about is used to be the top end players. You wanted good young pros. That's what you wanted. Mm-hmm. I think now you want good old college players. Armando Baycott fits that description. And I think players of that position are going to fit that description. But Carolina and Duke need to go out and get some more players that look like that. And this is why when Gerald Owens was talking to Roy Williams in the WRL Daily Download episode, you know, he had kind of. It's like, hey, are you done? Have people reached out to you? Now, I'm not surprised that people have reached out yeah. to Roy Williams to be like, are you sure you're done? But uh, on the, on on the same token, like, I'm not surprised that Roy Williams said, no, 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 I'm legitimately done, and and you'll enjoy his reasons why he's done. I've had one or two two people reach out to see if I'm done, and I told both of them I am. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm where I'm standing is really nice, and. Uh, uh, I play, I've done something this year that I'd never done in my life. I played golf in December. Mm-hmm. I played golf in January. Mm-hmm. And February's coming, and I've never played a round of golf wow. in February in my life. Mm-hmm. And so it's uh, those parts I really like. But I'm done. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm done. There's, there's not enough money to uh, make me go back. Have you cut your handicap in half yet? No, with the knee surgeries, I get using that as an excuse. But it's, I'm going to be better this summer. I've, I play in a couple of tournaments, and I love the competition, and uh, uh, I do gamble a little bit, and I enjoy talking trash, and, <laughs> and I enjoy taking the trash. At, uh, but uh, uh, the golf, when I was coaching, the golf course was the only place that I could go and lose myself. I, when I had a putt on the 12th green, I wasn't thinking about who I needed to call that night. Mm-hmm. And in every other thing I did, with the exception of hugging and playing with the grandchildren, uh, everything else I did, I could be in a meeting with uh, uh, anybody, and I'm still thinking about what am I need to do for our basketball team. Mm-hmm. I could be eating the greatest meal ever, and I'm thinking, what time is it? I've got to make a call. Uh, but the golf course was the one place that I could get away, so I'm still enjoying that. What do the grandkids think about your retirement? You know, they thought it was pretty neat. The two older ones uh, now is 13 and 11. Uh, but they really enjoyed going to the games and making some of the trips. And the two youngest one, five and three, they didn't have any idea. Right. And, uh, you know, I was concerned about uh, uh, Scott and Kimberly, our two children, and uh, Scott just wanted to know if he could still get Jordan shoes. <laughs> 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 and uh, Kimberly was uh, a little more emotional than, than Scott was, but uh, mm-hmm. she's a dance instructor. It's all she ever wanted to do, and she owns her own dance studio. So. In my eyes, she's closer to coaching, mm-hmm. and, and Scott's in the financial world. It's a business, and uh, uh, but I was I was very emotional at the time when I was telling both of them. Coach, you know every team's different, mm-hmm. uh, even if you have most of the same players, mm-hmm. because it's a different year, things are different, people get injured. Um, is there a time or a period in your coaching career, a five-year period, where you said, you know what, that's the best of my career, that's my most favorite time as a coach? Oh, gosh, I loved practice, mm. you know, and I loved getting after them, and I loved seeing them improve. I loved the relationships. And, and today's kids, you know, they've always got the earplugs in and everything, mm. and that didn't bother me. I'd walk up behind it. The kids say, if you turn around and say hello, I'll give you $100, and they'd just keep walking. <laughs> I'd say, what about $1,000? And they'd keep walking, and then I'd point at another teammate, and he'd pull it out, and I'd say, how about 2000 And the other guys were laughing. So I'd, I'd mess with them all the time, but uh, – no, I, it was the greatest thrill for me every single day because mm-hmm. I loved it. And it's, uh, but I'm, uh, it's, uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing now. And it was time. I was 70 years old, going to be 71 in three or four months after I retired. So, mm-hmm. so it was the right time. But uh, uh, it's, uh, I had a friend that uh, uh, gave me some golf balls. And, uh, Pulled them out and looked at the numbers, and the other guy brought them to me. And 
One of them had the number nine on it, and another one had uh, two zeros, and another one had three. And I said, he said, do you have any idea what that stands for? And I said, 9,003, we won 903 games, not 9,003. I would have loved that. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, that's what I thought you would say. But the fact of the matter is it was uh, nine Final Fours, three national championships, and double zero regrets. And that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. You and Mike Krzyzewski, you yeah. guys fierce rivals, you know, for so many years. Mm -hmm. Are you guys really friends or is that for the camera? Well, I mean, no, 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 it's an easy question to answer. It's just I have to think because when you say friends, that means somebody you socialize with. And, mm -hmm. you know, for 100 years, it seemed like he had his family and he had his team. And that's the way he went. And I had my family and I had my team. And that's why, you know, we didn't go to dinner. Uh, he doesn't play golf. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't go on vacations. There's nobody in coaching that I competed with uh, in the ACC anywhere other than Coach Smith. There's nobody that I respect more than I respect Michael. Mm -hmm. And I mean that sincerely. When I was coaching at Kansas, we were on a lot of NABC, National Association of Basketball Coaches, mm -hmm. committees. And invariably, we, we almost always had the same outlook, what was best for college basketball. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we thought the game similarly. Uh, we thought it was good to have kids to play extremely hard and to play for the name on the front of the jersey, not just the name on the back. Uh, so nobody's got more respect than Roy Williams has for Mike Krzyzewski. But when you say friends, that's somebody you go play golf with. And, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't do that because I say I, I'm totally devoted to basketball in my family. And so was he. Mm -hmm. And then in the off season, you know, we're still recruiting. We see each other. We'd always say hello. We'd, uh, so I would say friends, but not the kind that uh, uh, you stay with a lot. But if I were to see Michael walk in the door right now, I would smile. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty good. And uh, last one, do you yeah. have a dream for some? You may have already played it. Yeah. Uh, I ha anybody, you know. Yeah. It, that's an easy question because it's it's not uh, uh, Tiger Woods and Beyonce or anything like that, you know, <laughs> which wouldn't be bad playing off of a couple right. of people like that. Uh, but uh, it's very easy. It's three of my buddies because mm -hmm. there's nothing better than being out there. And I've, I've been very fortunate. I mean, I've played, I mean, Jack Nicholas one time said, Coach, come here and watch my golf swing and tell me what you think. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what, are, what is the matter with you, boy? Uh -huh. and, uh, and I've been fortunate enough. I played uh, 27 holes with President Obama. Wow. And I loved it. It's one of the greatest days I've ever had on a golf course. But if I'm going to go out and play golf, I'd rather be with my buddies than anything because uh, – uh, when I play golf now, one of the guys I played with, I played Little League Baseball against. Really? You wow. know? And so for me, playing with my buddies is the best thing. And but like I say, I've, I've been very fortunate to play and be in tournaments where other people are around. And President Obama was a thrill of my life uh, to be able to play golf with him, too. And does he get extra, like, strokes? Uh, does Secret Service kick the ball out back in the fairway? He was my partner. Oh, good. So I told the Secret <laughs> Service people what to kick with ball to kick out. Hearing Roy Williams talk about former President Barack Obama also made me realize that the whole game has changed with Duke and Carolina. I don't I felt I felt this at Cameron Indoor this past season when it was John Shire and Hubert Davis. The celebrity factor is not there yet. They're gonna these coaches are gonna have to generate their own celebrity cool guy list that'll show up to these games. I, I don't think we're gonna get that kind of thing to show up for a while. Maybe I'll be wrong, but uh, hearing that story and the relationships that Roy Williams has built over the years, that's what Hubert Davis and John Shire are going to be doing now that they're the head coaches at Duke and Carolina, respectively. So that is the bonus episode of the Roy Williams podcast, that daggum podcast. Uh, how are we going to milk another episode, Joe? There's got to be another way. <laughs> I, I would love, you know, the one thing that I know Roy, I think, hasn't done is played golf at Lonnie Poole. Ooh. So I think maybe we can entice him. Okay, let's do it. P through golf, right? Absolutely. Like, yeah, through, golf the, has to be the it. only way you can do anything is look, through golf. And you can say to him, look, man, there's a championship level course that you've not played. And you can do it with us. It'll be a safe space. And you would go over there. And I'm, I'm sure he would set whatever record because it's at state. He never loses at state. So I, I think that, right, that, that might be something for us to do. All right, that'll be the follow-up. Maybe we can convince him this summer 
or next to play out at Lonnie Pool. So if you enjoyed this episode, uh, by all means, check out other episodes in A Brief History of Triangle Sports, uh, where we highlight other aspects of that Duke Carolina rivalry, along with other aspects of Triangle Sports life that you might not be aware of, including a World League of American football team that lasted one season, one season only, and didn't win a game, the Raleigh-Durham Skyhawks. So check that out, all part of a brief history of Triangle Sports. This has been the Roy That Dadgum Legend Podcast. This podcast is a part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network. Enjoy and download on the WRAL Sports Fan app or wherever you get your podcasts.